Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've met quite a few of you, this being my second um, stint at the podium. First with the PDM class and then the MBA class. I felt their pain because it's a graveyard shift. Um, and then I have you guys tonight. So thank you. Um, it was, yeah, it was quite a privilege to, to get an email from, from Owen and Gavin saying, we would like to have you on campus because I've been, I've been asking to come back. I love this place. It just, when it's part of your system, you can't get it out. Even when I've got a meeting in East London, I'll fly to PE and drive through Grabstown <laughs> and fly out of East London um, just because I love this place so much. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of why I'm here tonight. Um, I've been asked to um, speak about the Fees Must Fall brand um, and kind of look at it through the lens of marketing and branding, which is what I do. Um, and yeah, so the topic of discussion is applying branding principles to fees must fall. So I suppose at the very beginning, I need to declare that I think that free education would be an amazing thing to achieve as a country. I think that we all aspire to a country where our, our fortunes as a country, our, our potential, our propensity to, to succeed isn't hampered or undermined by lack of access to education. The Freedom Charter is quite clear. The doors of, of learning need to open to everybody so people can have access. Um, I think the family that you're born into, the income bracket that you're born into, the LSM that you've got the misfortune of, of belonging to should not limit your, your potential. So yeah, so my, my take on the whole subject is it would be really amazing if education was free and accessible to everybody. But also having an economics degree, I understand how government revenues work, I understand how spending works, I understand how budgeting works, um, and budgeting is, is based on strategy, it's based on choices. You know, um, if you look at where government is spending money, if you look at the revenue coming in, the, rev the expenses, and so on, if you look at the current balance, if you look at, you know, um, all those factors, you look at the size of the fiscus, yes, we've, we've grown to a trillion rand. If you look at all the trade-offs and all the basket of priorities that the Treasury uh, grapples with, it's quite easy to understand why Sometimes the Minister of Education will say they can't afford certain things at this point in time. But I think everybody kind of agrees that at some point we need to get to a place where education is actually affordable, if not free. Uh, but for that to happen, we need to have a growing economy. We need to have an economy that's productive as opposed to consumption based. But when you've inherited the kind of economy that we have as a, as a democratic dispensation, there are a lot of things that need to be fixed. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the book, the famous book that was written about Tabon Becky, A Dream Deferred. I mean, that's all about taming people's hunger um, for economic freedom. Because once you've, you've acquired political freedom, the next thing is it must translate to money, it must translate to, um, you know, um, economic wherewithal and having the means to, to live your full potential. Um, but um, the government had to make some choices. You know, do we go into a growth phase? Do we go into fiscal dis discipline so we can grow the fiscus, so we can grow the economy, and therefore be able to give these services for free? Or do we become, do we become more of a socialist state because you know, we're a developmental country, there's people that um, have a, an insatiable appetite for things to be provided to them for free, and how do you balance all those things? So I, can have, I, I, I have sympathy for, for people in government and what they do. Um, What's, what's not nice is to see, you know, the Auditor General talking about wasteful and fruitless expenditure. What's not nice is to see how much corruption eats away at our ability to provide the kind of society and world we want to live in, and how that undermines our ability to provide things that should be human rights. But be that as it may, government has a job to do, and I think they know what they need to do. I've been reading the National Development Plan, masterstroke, beautiful document, but, um, you know, strategy without execution is daydreaming. So let's get into what I'm here to talk about. Um, and I think the first thing that I want to mention is the Fees Must Fall movement, intended or unintended, is a brand, right? And being a brand, there's a couple of rules that apply to brands. And I think what's really important is, as a brand, you need to be clear about what your role is in society. You're getting into people's space, you're getting into people's conversations, lexicon, their vocabulary, part of their lifestyle. And you've got to be clear about the role that you play. If you're not clear, people will determine the role that you play. 
And the way I see it is, this is a student movement created to make the dream of free education a reality. Now that makes this brand an activist brand. And there's a couple of characteristics that define an activist brand. So let's look at the three. The first one, very clearly, is that activists identify a cause that humanity cares about. Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Che Guevara, Thomas Sankara. People that have done amazing things to change the world. Bono from U2. So you look at those guys and you say they found a cause that they wanted to kind of be known for. They wanted to hang their legacy around. The next important characteristic is they choose the role they want to play. Because there are different roles you can play. You can be somebody who just shines a spotlight on a problem. You're creating awareness, that's awesome. And you walk away, you do nothing to try and do something, you know, to, to solve the issue. But you've made everybody aware. Um, or you could be a change agent. You want to agitate discontent with the status quo. You tell people what's wrong with the status quo. And you do something about it. You play an active role in removing the hindrance or the obstacle if you perceive it to be such. Or you improve people's lives. Or you can actually be an enabler, right? So I'm going to use all my resources as, let's say, Vodacom. I'm going to use technology to help people improve their lives. If I'm Cadbury and 90% of my cocoa comes from cocoa plantations in West Africa, specifically Ghana, am I going to spend the majority of my CSI budget empowering cocoa farmers? Very simple. You want every cocoa farmer to have a cell phone because with cell phones, you've got access to the world, to the internet, access to markets. You can look at the price of cocoa trading on the world market on a daily basis and determine when to sell and when to buy. Now that's changing your life. That's empowering you to become a small business as opposed to a little farmer out in the sticks somewhere. But brands have to take an active role in doing something about the issues that humanity cares about for them to be relevant or you can choose to do nothing. But once you've identified a cause and you're very clear about the role you want to play, you create a movement. Like-minded people who care about the cause as much as you do. You mobilize participation. You get people to buy into the dream. And you make it easy for them to sign up and to join. Now, the reason why Fees Must got so much you know, applause and love and admiration from many quarters, just like the Pretoria Girls, where, where my cousin is a prefect, um, is because Fees Must Fall did all of that. We all know the Gini coefficient in our country. In fact, the worst place, the worst Gini coefficient in our country is in Khrafrenet, and I'll get to Khrafrenet in a minute, mostly because of GT Ferreira and Rupert, because everybody else is poor. So the disproportionate distribution of income there is an interesting case study. To reflection of, the, of our society today. So those three things should kind of be borne in mind when we think about fees must fall and how, the, and how the brand needs to evolve. So some of the guys that have captured our imagination, some of the guys that have used their, their fame, their resources, their might, their time on earth to make a difference and they'll be remembered for such. So fees must fall identified a cause, that's free education, the role is to be a change agent from what I've read, from what I've seen, uh, and from the dealings that I've had with student leaders. Incidentally, I was part of something called SASFI. Anybody know SASFI? South African Student Fund for Education. Formed by former leaders at Verse University, former SRC presidents like Tia Homoseneke, Mos Mashishi, Keskovadia, all those guys. Um, they got together and they said, we need to do something about fees must fall. We want to put together a fund, an endowment fund, that's going to go towards making education accessible into perpetuity. So we got, we got called in as Ogilvy, as communications uh, practitioners, to come and help them give birth to this brand um, and do something about it and create awareness for it and so on. And, um, and the vision is to take it around the country and have every university kind of aligned to it. So quite a nice initiative. Um, so we spend time with SRC leaders, with student leaders, talking about what the issues are and what needs to happen. So some of the stuff I'll be talking about is informed by that kind of background. Okay, and then participation, started a movement. And uh, the thing about a movement is you've got to think about three phases. Pre the movement development, 
the movement is in existence, what do you do to lead and direct the movement in addressing one particular cause? And once you're done with this cause, what do you do with the movement? There's this amazing energy and spirit and passion that was, brought, that was created and brought to bear to fight a particular cause in society. And when that obstacle has been removed, albeit temporarily, what do you do with that energy and passion? It needs to find an outlet. If you don't lead it, it can become destructive. If you lead it, you've got to identify the next horizon. What is the next thing we're going to tackle? How do we leave a positive legacy? Nothing worse than creating a movement, being a leader, and then when you've identified one cause and dealt with it, there's no leadership. What happens to the, to the followers? What is the next call to action? So a critical analysis of FISMA 4. There's a couple of things that we've kind of identified as hurdles and challenges. So education is for a number of good reasons, valid reasons, bad reasons, you decide. Alumni, society, and corporate apathy. Corporates are accused of doing very little to help. Some corporates we know, they've had bursaries and funds and scholarships for many, many years. But by and large, the feedback we're getting is corporates must come to the party. Listen to every soundbite. Student leaders get interviewed. Corporate must do more. Society must do more. Alumni must do more. <coughs> Risk avoidance by corporate. Does corporate want to align with the fees must fall movement? You've got to critically analyze the brand and say, how is the brand positioned? How does the brand behave? What does the fees must fall movement stand for? What messages does it emanate? I mean, does it, does it emit, um, emit consciously or unconsciously? What are some of the unintended consequences of you know, the actions of, of the fees must fall brand? And if you expect brands and from corporate specifically to get involved and partner with the fees must fall movement, understand the rules of brand association. Why do two brands come together? Why does a brand come together with a cause? How does the, how does the cause help the brand advance its vision? How does the cause help, it, help a brand get to where it wants to get to in terms of mission and vision? And if we're not respectful of the rules of brand association, we won't have a marriage. If we want to consummate a strong relationship between the owners of capital, owners of resource, with causes that must be dealt with for our society to thrive, we've got to understand what the rules of engagement are. We've got to understand what builds a marriage and a relationship. What does value look like to students and to the youth? What does value look like to corporate? And I think just unpacking that whole conversation helps us build synergies and helps us make sense of a relationship that we know is necessary. Things like vandalism, arson, anarchy undermine the cause. So the cause is free education, access to education. People align behind the cause. It makes sense. It's great. We have to get to that. And some, some of these things happen. Society starts to question, actually, are we still on the right track? Does that help the cause? Does that undermine the cause? And then the feedback is, well, that's the only language that people in authority understand. And that needs to be interrogated. Party politics, affiliation sometimes threatens unity in the movement. We've seen across many campuses, different parties <coughs> claiming victory. Is it about victory? Is it about egos? Is it about political parties? Or is it about the cause? The ego is a problem in many, many organizations. The ego often is the enemy of progress. The minute you start claiming glory for something, you lose focus on the cause and the thing you're trying to achieve. And we've seen that with many brands. And then the allure of power and its consequences, again, linked to ego. So in a relationship, you gain power because you've defeated certain things. What do you do with the new acquired power? What do you, how do you use it? How does that enable you to get through the mission that you identified in the first place? Do you use it constructively, destructively? So you've got to think about these things. And I'm not casting aspersions. I'm not making value judgments. I'm just asking critical questions that we must bear in mind. So the marketing journey. So I'll use a couple of kind of categories that we use in marketing to look at um, you know, how we reflect on the evolution of the brand Fismos 4. The first one is identification. 
So when we, when we deal with brands, we make choices around where to play and how to win. And the first one being choosing where to play and who you want to serve. So what calls do you identify? Um, and what's your target market? The next one is understanding the needs of those you're serving. Is it one need? Is it two need, needs? Is it five needs? And which ones do you want to, to do something about? Definition, building your brand and looking at your brand architecture. So if you've identified more than one need, you might need two or three brands or a mother brand and a couple of sub brands to talk to those needs. Innovation, extend your offering, expand your horizons. Connection is about once ident you've identified a target market and a category where you want to compete, you've got your brand, you've got your brand with rifle focus on the kind of issues you want to tackle, develop a way of connecting and mobilizing with people. Because you want a fan club, you want, you want people to follow you or fall in love with you. So understand how you're going to engineer that. And very importantly, have goals to assess, are we doing well, are we not? How do we cause correct? Then you measure performance so you can fix and optimize. So choosing where you want to play, I've just picked four out of 12 archetypes from a guy called Carl Golden. And, um, and I'll talk about four for tonight. The first one is, is your brand a magician? Do you make dreams come true? So I had the privilege at the age of 20 to work on a brand called X, which we know is about seduction. It's about making young men feel attractive and invincible and handsome and you know, devoid of any insecurities. What insecurities? And X is a magician. You spray it on and you become Don Juan de Marco. <laughs> Are you a rebel? Do you believe that fundamentally that rules have to be broken? Is that what you stand for as a brand? Or are you a hero? Do you come and save the day? Do you perform courageous acts? Lastly, are you a caregiver? Do you protect and care for others? So kind of understand what, which archetype you want to align yourself with, because that determines how you behave going forward. So if we look at that, do we say the brand fees must fall as a hero? There was an issue, there was a cause. The brand decided what they want to do about it, be a change agent, and mobilize resources, mobilize people, form the movement, sort out a problem, albeit temporarily. So is it a hero brand? Maybe. Let's look at some brands. So Kotex, a brand health issues and share knowledge and phenomenal 18% sales growth just by identifying a cause and doing something about it just to kind of drive love brand love and commitment and so on. Hellman's uh, is a Mayo brand um, and what they did there was because they had junk in a jar because of all the additives and artificial stuff they had to do something about it. They started a green and health movement uh, championing real natural and locally sourced food and the movement encouraged consumers to grow, cook, and eat uh, real food instead of having um, editors. And they also saw volume and market share growth. American Express, another one of our global clients, they came up with Small Saturday, um, which is really about powering small businesses and creating a market for small business, getting people to support small business. So it's one day a year, and it's a major event, and uh, markets, they bring people to support small businesses. And in a year where sales growth were, were quite soft, they saw overall sales growth, these business people, of 9%. But transactions on, on American Express card among small businesses grew up by 28%. And then there's also an, another cause that I really like from one of our global clients, Unilever, Lifeboy, which is about helping a child get to the age of five. Started off in India, in a small rural village where Infant mortality was quite high because of Bilhazia, dirty water, kids playing in water and dying as a result, not getting to the age of five. So Lifeboy being, being a soap, identified this as a cause, decided what they want to do about it, formed the whole movement around it of socializing the issue with people and getting to do, to do something about it. And it's seen phenomenal success. So Oh,
ये गुंडा भगत पहला बच्चा है जो पांच साल की उम्र तक पहुंचा है So there's a very clear call to action to join the movement to do something about the issue. Yep. So some of the things that you see when you think about Freeze Must Fall or when it gets presented in the media is some of the stuff that we're not really proud of. Um, but that's just the reality of the conversation. So maybe some people aren't listening in places of authority and people turn to this. But then people also need to look at what help do they want? What legacy do they want to create? What brand image do they want to portray? And think about the unintended consequences of that. And then ask the critical questions. How are you going to draw support if this is the image that keeps coming up? Like the library at uh, UKZN. So what I wanted to look at here is if we say we want to understand the needs of those we serve, let's look at them in three buckets. The first kind of bucket of needs is pre-varsity needs. So you're in high school, you're a learner, you need career guidance. So when I was young, um, you know, my mom was a nursing lecturer. My dad, after playing soccer, went into business. So I grew up in a family business, quite a retail environment that got into my blood. But I watched a lot of LA law, loved Blair Underwood, and thought, I want to be a lawyer. Um, and, you know, kind of got into law school, met Mr. Glover, did some interesting things, um, but then finished law school after working at the legal aid clinic, defending some drunk students and chicory farmers outside Grahamstown. And thought, I don't want to live my life like this. I'd rather marry a lawyer, which I did, and got into marketing. But um, yeah, I wish somebody had said, don't let your favorite soul piece determine your career choices in life. <laughs> Mentorship and job shadowing, um, that's a very important need in high schools. Varsity access. The fee thing is a very important thing. So just by looking at the bottom rung of those needs, it's more than just about fees. You get to the middle rung, varsity needs. You're now here, you need life skills training. How do you survive the harsh realities of being in a liberated space like a university campus? Yeah, from a home, from a school, you're now facing the world on your own, a thousand k's away from home. Mentorship, financial support, and work experience, school holidays. Do you go to your job? Do you go home? Which ecosystem do you join when you leave this world? How do you prepare for job interviews? How do you make yourself attractive to recruiters on campus when you haven't spent a day in the workplace? And then lastly, once you've graduated, is there a job waiting for you? Or is there a business idea waiting to be given birth to? How do you find a job? You're in a job, who mentors you? Do you believe that corporate is a hostile, unfriendly environment for black graduates? You'll never get anywhere because there's a ceiling. Do you believe that corporate is hostile for women because everything is about men? Or do you believe corporate doesn't hire white people because of affirmative action? Who helps you deal with those stereotypes and perceptions? Who gives you perspective? Who says don't care about stereotypes? They're self-limiting beliefs. Silence the, the pessimist and the critic and the judge in your head and be an optimist and don't care about those things. When people come and interview me for magazines and newspapers and whatnot, they always ask, so tell us about what it's like to be a black man running big corporate. What are the issues? What are the issues you face as a black leader in business? And I say, but where does the race thing come in? How about, let's start with, tell me about business. What challenges do you face? The color of my skin doesn't determine the kind of problems I attract. Problems love company. You must just dodge problems when they come your way. <laughs> or confront them and do something about it. So people need support. They need to have conversations with people who've, who 
who've been trailblazers, who've, who've seen the movie before. And I think very importantly, for this thing to be sustainable, we've got to create a movement around paying it forward. So I do a lot of work with UCT Business School, with Vets Business School, with Gibbs, but it just kept burning me that I'm doing nothing with Rhodes. I spent five years here. This is where my mind was shaped. I'm a leader today because I, because I was here. When I was here, Eden Grove didn't exist. You know, it was just a bush where you would kiss girls. So, <laughs> Being back here, doing what I'm doing, is kind of, you know, paying it forward, uh, making sure the cycle continues. And we've got to find ways as alumni, as practitioners in business, as captains of industry, as people who've got resources to do something. Because you can't just look to government to solve all the problems. Government isn't the business. So, let's look at potential interventions. So we said there's probably about 11 needs. Let's look at potentially 11 interventions. So the first one is pre-varsity. There's career guidance. You can come up with a school outreach program by varsity students. Some people have done that already. You can look at mentorship program between learners and varsity students. I know some campuses do that. You can look at an active job shadowing program. You can look at the fees must fall movement driving access to free education or affordable education. You can look at financial assistance, NEFSAs, and all those things. When you're in varsity, you can look at career guidance and mentorship. So linking students with professionals. Are we doing that? We as alumni, are we giving up our time? Are we extending our hand and saying we want a partner? Do we adopt five students per alumni? People that you can mentor via email, via Skype, or face to face. Job shadowing, ongoing financial support and vacation jobs, and then post-varsity career fairs, linking companies to students, on-the-job mentorship, and so on, and creating an active alumni. So there's a number of things that can be done that, again, can be driven by students. So remember, we've identified a cause which is making education accessible and affordable or even free. We've decided our role is to be a change agent. We've formed a movement. But the movement can achieve more than just one objective, so why only choose one? And then we get to the fact that all these needs are interconnected. And many of us have quite a linear approach to problem solving. You know, there's a problem, there's a solution, there's a result. But actually, I find systems thinking quite interesting. It's a system of interconnectedness, of drivers and outcomes. Because not everything is linear. You've got to look at the problem from different angles and say, what are all the factors at play? Because that liberates the mind to think creatively and think of multiple solutions. And that's how you gain sustainability. That's how you have success for the long term. Because you're not going to have surprises coming to bite you. right? Because your solution wasn't predetermined. It wasn't a linear equation of a conversion process, inputs, outputs, result. It was about, what are the drivers? What are the barriers? What are the linkages? Yeah, that's the point there. So you define your brand. You decide which needs you want to address. And then you define yourself around that. So let's take five. Career guidance is one. Mentorship or life skill training is another. Work experience is another. Getting a job is another. And paying it forward is another. So how about positioning our brand, fees must fall, along five important needs? and not just access. What can we do? We can look at a brand architecture that's, built of, that's made up of a mother brand that addresses the primary need, and we look at a couple of sub-brands that address complementary needs. How does that look? Something like that. A mother brand with six sub-brands. Let's flesh it out. The mother brand, we call it hashtag youth champions. And what does it look after? Free education. What do we do there? We mobilize people around a sub-brand called Fees Must Fall. Very clear, it's about access. Whether it's affordability or it's free, we must think about what makes economic sense, what's sustainable, and we deal with that conversation as one. The next sub-brand, enter financial assistance. Each one, fund one, as a hashtag. Anybody who can afford to contribute towards funding a student should do so across the length and breadth of our, of our country. Different call to action. Right? Don't want to get involved in anything. Don't want to march. 
don't want to do anything. I want to contribute a thousand bucks silently every month. And I feel good about myself when I drink Johnny Walker Blue. Each one host a student or students. So I get many calls for people wanting to come and job shadow, people at Ogilvy for a day, a week, a month. I never say no. Never. Doesn't, you can test me or you can call me tomorrow and ask to visit for a week. It doesn't cost us anything. We learn a hell of a lot from you, you know, um, and we give back. Just you observe what we do, as long as you respect confidentiality. But that week can actually go back onto your CV and, you know, it can help you make choices in life. And that's a movement. The next one is skills development. Train a student or students. And the last one is employment. Each one hire a student. Make it your, your mission to create employment. Nothing more disheartening than thousands of graduates coming out of tertiary institutions and not being absorbed by the labor market. Very disheartening. We can do an amazing job of creating excess on the one hand, but excess without opportunity at the end is only half a victory. And what are you creating when you're producing students that aren't absorbed? What happens to their passion and energy? What happens to their needs? We're talking about 20, 21 year olds. They're in the dating scene. They want to have money to go on a date. They want to be productive. They've sucked up resources. They've got debts to pay. So I think our imagination is a little bit wider. So, a couple of pro, uh, examples. So there's a competitor brand called Dreamfields Project. I say it's a competitor because I run a football foundation. Um, when my dad died in 2003, we formed a football foundation um, called the Johnny Mukwena Football Foundation, which looks at investing in grassroots soccer. Um, we try and build infrastructure. We can raise funds. We do tournaments to honor legends. Uh, we do life skills training, we give equipment and that sort of thing. Dreamfields Project does the same thing. It's founded by John Pullman. And what they do is they've got a couple of products under the Football Foundation. They've got dream bags, soccer kits. You call them up, you say, we've got a team in Lusikisiki. We need support. We haven't got boots, we haven't got socks, we haven't got kits. It's 2,500 rand to kit out a whole soccer team of 15 players. That's, that's dinner for some people. Dream Fields. They built, they built soccer, soccer pitches with turf, with grass. It costs about 70,000 rand to lay down grass, about 20,000 rand to put up a borehole. Poles, you know, soccer poles are like whatever, a thousand bucks. Now you can stimulate local economies by just getting the community to turn into suppliers and they supply you with those things. You make an impact. Then they also do dream leagues. So they have leagues that run with SAFA, they're affiliated. And this is about somebody trying to make sure that Bafana Bafana succeed eventually by investing in the factory. <laughs> we all want that to happen. Dream coaching. So train the trainer, coaching clinics, and then lastly, dream events, amazing events in communities. We try and do the same thing with our brand. But I think what I'm trying to illustrate here is they didn't just go in and say, we're going to set up a high performance culture where we can train 100 kids to be amazing soccer players. They said, what is the multiplicity of needs out there? You know, our performance as a nation in the 2010 World Cup got a lot of people thinking about the factory that produces soccer stars. And everybody referenced Brazil as an example. Every street corner, there's indoor soccer, there's outdoor soccer. The whole nation is geared towards being a winning soccer nation. And a lot of people rallied behind this need to kind of invest in grassroots soccer and so on. And these kind of initiatives came up. But it wasn't just about skill building. It was about the sum total of those needs. So and then this, um, this is about driving en engagement or engineering social participation. There's three points there. You've got to grab attention. You've got to mobilize participation. But very, very importantly, sustain interest and momentum. 
Because people that ride around, of course, sometimes get tired. You get particip participant fatigue. You get people who say, oh, old head, heard about it, I did something about it, and then you withdraw your support. So it's very important to think actively around what is the first horizon, what is the next horizon, how do I sustain belief and commitment towards this cause? Because for anything to be sustainable, we've got to be thinking, right, of the ecosystem, of the value chain, kind of transitioning from one phase to the next phase. So I'll show you a little thing at Hope, which KFC allowed us to work on. So if you care about fighting world hunger, all you need to do is donate two bucks. And what we did as an agency is we gave them a way to make it easy. We added Ed Hope as a menu item because, you know, um, the, 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 the staff at KFC, you know, we're, we're quite shy about asking people to donate money. But it's easy if you say, do you want to add a side dish called Ed Hope? Chances are you'll say yes. So there's also another initiative that I was involved in. Um, you've heard of CEDA Campus, the free university. They've got a couple of, I mean, now there's Siva Education. They've got a campus called Eden Campus out in Karatra, which is about 50 k's outside Naizna. It's quite a, quite a special place to visit. Um, and, and their vision is to ignite opportunity. Their mission is to develop entrepreneurial leaders who ignite opportunity and social change. The concept is it's a non-profit uh, business school where students don't pay fees. They don't pay back scholarships. All they have to do is pay it forward. So an interesting concept. They grow all their food, they do everything themselves, all the services are provided by students. The lecturers are people like us who come for free and do stuff. Um, it's quite a sustainable model, it's been happening for many years. Google it, they've achieved funders. The alumni is doing amazing things and it's quite an interesting vicious cycle. This is a project that I had the privilege of being part of. I'll play the video and then I'll expand on it. Thank you. 
management, security. So they'll all tie into each other and a knock on effect of that is going to impact the entire community. It will give everyone in the town the opportunity to love out their dreams as a rainbow nation. And the dignity of people who once say they were poor without an ability. We get to change lives with this project. The flag is situated uh, just about five years in the south of South Africa. And it's particularly important because you can see it from the day of desolation. Everyone will be able to see the flag if you enter our town. It's a living flag and it's a growing flag. And, uh, it will be around uh, for thousands of years. It will be trees, it will be plants. This is a long-term sustainable economic development project and I think that's what makes it completely unique. It definitely is a wild idea. It's beyond the scope of imagination. There's much more to it than, than, than just a flag. It's so unique like us and it is quite dramatic like us. Though we're diverse, we can be, we are one and should be one. And the flag is symbolic of that potential. But we've got to live that. Otherwise, we won't achieve that. This flag brings the hope that we can live together. This is a new beginning for my people. It's about a dream, it's about what we can become. This is a global story. It's beautiful for South Africa, but it'll be symbolic in terms of what's possible. We need everyone to make this day come true. So please Google it. It's quite an amazing idea. When I was MD of FCB, we worked on this. The whole idea was our flag is the third most recognized flag in the, in, in the world. Um, and we wanted to come up with a flag that creates an endowment fund to power the economy of Frafrenet, where we have the worst Gini coefficient. And the idea was very simple. 66 hectares South African flag that you can see from space, but you can also see when you're flying between Joburg and PE and Joburg and Cape Town, where the two flight paths intersect, that's where the flag will be. And the black triangle in the middle is a four megawatt solar panel that powers the town of Hrafrinet, generating millions of revenue in terms of selling energy back to the grid that goes into a fund. The white stripes, those are semi-permeable roads where tourists are gonna drive and walk through to get to see this living flag. Um, and there's a big cactus uh, supplier in Hrafrinet who can produce those two million um, desert succulents. There'll be, there'll be honey um, harvested from you know, the bees that are, they'll be part of the flag. There'll be speck bone planted for you know, carbon, um, um, you know, carbon emissions and stuff. Um, there'll be you know, uh, water harvested, so um, um, carbon sequestration through speck bone. There'll be water harvested, so kept, ke uh, catchment areas under the solar panel. And underneath the solar panel will be a three-story high building, uh, which will have a hotel, business precinct, tourism center, social entrepreneur kind of center. So basically creating more than 700 permanent green collar jobs, probably about a few thousands of jobs in the construction <laughs> phase. But the whole thing is designed probably to be about a 100 million rand endowment fund that powers this community into perpetuity. Now the reason I use this example is the issue in that place was there's a lot of poverty. Do we go in and try and do something about poverty? Or do we say, actually, what are, what are all the issues that they're battling with? And what interventions can one come up with? If you can double the tourism in Khrafrinet, if you can get visitors to spend an additional night, that'll do wonders for the economy of Khrafrinet. But you can only do that if you imagine big ideas like this sort of thing. Everybody will want to see this flag, a flag the size of 60 rugby fields, and that's quite something. Flag you can see from space. So, so when we're imagining the issues that the youth face, 
we're not just imagining access to education. We imagine what does it, what does it take to build leaders? What does it take to build constructive members of society? What does it take to build men and women of principle who can really shape the economics of the world, the politics of the world? And we look at the multiplicity of needs as well as intervention points, understanding that people that we look to to help us fight some of these battles might be drawn to different intervention points, not just one. So that helps you build a sustainable movement. I done with that one. So I think very important point is society helps those who help themselves. And what I mean by that is, as a cause, you have to be attractive to others. People have to want to partner with you. Charity begins at home. You have to have skin in the game. You've got to do something to alleviate your own pain before you expect others to join. And pay for it. It has to be sustainable. If you've benefited, you've got to pull others up with you. Just a couple of ideas that have helped um, and I think could help. So we learned from that Eden Campus thing that going green could be quite amazing. So, you know, growing your own stuff, growing your own timber if you like. Let me move. Um, recycle, reuse, grow your own veggies, you know, breed your own chickens. But also another idea that I like is generating electricity. So we've all seen these, these bikes. You know, when you travel around Europe, you go to the airports, in some of the airports there's bikes where you can just cycle and generate enough electricity to actually charge your phone or your iPod or your iPad. These bikes, pedaling one can produce enough electricity to power a home for 24 hours. So maybe we look at reconfiguring our gyms and make them sources of electricity. And we take turns. We look at creating an ecosystem of entrepreneurs on campus. We create a yellow pages for students. Each one learn a skill. Become a painter, a carpenter, a plumber, night watchman. If you muscle, you know, you've got muscles and you can fight people. Um, you know, you've got free time, you become an au pair. You, there's lots of stuff that we can do as students to generate revenue, to alleviate our own pain. And we can facilitate that. Instead of yellow pages, you have a port, you have a portal. We can use our expertise in IT to come up with apps to make it easy. But what you're doing is you're building skills. You're making people productive and you're preparing them for the outside world. But while you're doing that, you're generating income and you're becoming part of the solution. You have skin in the game. And then this notion of free is the new premium. And we decide, you know, with toothpaste tubes, we can add another 20 mils and say you got for the same price, you get 20% more, 20% free. And we say 20% of teaching to be provided by people like Alistair who come for free. <laughs> but obviously, I take the lecture notes from Owen and Gavin and just, just come and be a mouthpiece. Um, and, and faculty can use that one day in the week to do other things and generate income elsewhere. We say to all lecturers, you only work four days a week instead of five. The fifth day is up to you what you do with it. If you don't want to earn less revenue, go and make money elsewhere. Or you know, work on your golf, work on your swing. And then one day in the week, we get volunteers to come and take over. 20% of services on campus to be provided by volunteers, including students. No brainer. 20% of the fees to be paid by crowdfunding, people like myself. You tell us, how much money do we need to contribute to fund 1,000 students? What does it mean? If you look at 1,000 alumni, how much is it a month for everyone? You might find that it's the price of a bottle of wine, which I'm happy to sacrifice. So it's about making it easy for people to join in, making it easy for them to participate, showing them that their contribution can be quite small but with a massive impact. That's what I wanted to share with you tonight. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Alice is very happy to, to take questions. Alice, I have to say that this is honestly one of the most profound business forums I've ever been to. Thank you. I'm quite emotional, actually. Thank you.
shows the depth of uh, how alumni want to. So we undertake to make sure that this tonight is, is distributed, Matthew. Okay, now that I've, now that I've calmed down. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, I think we, must, um, we must embrace the notion of social partnerships. I think all of us have a role to play. I think we're all part of the same ecosystem. I can't enjoy my life if I know that my livelihood is threatened by poor unemployed people who are angry, who are disillusioned about the possibility of emerging out of poverty and sometimes turn to crime. You know, I don't live in a free country. I don't enjoy reading about unemployed youth. I don't enjoy you know, knowing that there's a massive income disparity in the country. So I have a vested interest in doing something about it. I'm not a politician, I'm not in government. I'm just a guy who's trying to make a positive impact in society. Does it fall on the shoulders of students? Students are part of it, but not the only people who should take the, you know, the brunt of it. Students have a, have a very significant mandate, which is to come and get educated. That takes up quite a lot of your time. Students are at a, at a fragile part in their lives where they're self-defining, where, they, where they're grappling with transition from adolescence into adulthood. That's quite a traumatic experience. So a lot has been asked of students, and I don't think it's fair to expect students to drive all this thinking. I think all of us should come to the party, including government. And I think what, like I said, government is not a business. Government is not about making profit. Government isn't trusted with the fiscus and wherever else they get money from imports, exports, and so on, and, and everything, and you would know better about tax collection. And they have a couple of areas where they spend the money. That's, that's, that's what the budget is about. I see them as custodians of a pot of money, and they need to do responsible things with that pot of money so that we can thrive as a country. But government's not gonna create jobs. Government, you know, so anybody who can create jobs, anybody who can get into meaningful economic activity to stimulate growth of our economy should play a part in this thing. 